Hello everyone, uh, welcome to uh, the virtual GigaConf talk about Gigasom. My name is Mirka uh, I'm going to present the work on the Gigasom package, which is joint effort from multiple authors from multiple institutes, including ISB Prague, Luxembourg Institute of Health, Luxembourg Center for Systems Biomedicine, uh, University of Luxembourg and Elixir, the European Infrastructure for Life Sciences. You may actually remember Gigasom from the last JuliaCon from Baltimore from 2019 where Vasco was giving a quick talk on the original purpose of the pre preliminary version of Gigasom which was to run self-organizing map on cytometer data, on the big data that we get from cytometers and produce informative results from that including some clusterings or visualizations. Today I'm going to talk about the main interesting changes that we did from that time. Uh, basically, well, most importantly, uh, we made it scale much, much, much better than it was scaling that time. Uh, I'm also going to give a bit of background on cytometry and biology, and I'm going to present some minor results that we get. Uh, I have to say that our point of view of the whole situation with Gigasom is extremely user-centric because we are actually producing Gigasom for scientists to use, not for programmers which has an interesting implications on the design of the interface and design of the scaling mechanism that we used. Hopefully it will be interesting. Well, let's talk about cytometry. Cytometry is good for measuring individual properties of individual cells in a sample. Usually you get, to, you get a sample with millions of cells and you want to measure, for example, uh, expression of surface proteins on each of the individual cells so you can well, for example, categorize the cells into cell types like B cells, T cells, red blood cells and others. Uh, the problem is that the markers, the surface proteins, are usually too tiny to see or to measure with any reasonable method. So what you can do is to use a little trick and measure them indirectly. You can take, for example, fluorescent markers, uh, chemically bind them to specific proteins uh, so that uh, the specific markers with specific color bind to a specific protein and then just excite the cells with laser and measure the spectra that is produced by uh, shining onto uh, individual cells, which gets you a nice result. Basically, you get the matrix of expressions of the uh, surface proteins on each cell, uh, which can be used to categorize the cells and uh, see the properties of the cells and also measure lots of other interesting things relevant, for example, in immunology. The resulting data is usually processed by gating, which is basically uh, drawing uh, a scatter plot out of two properties of the cells, two measured columns of the matrix. And in the scatter plot, you can naturally see the clusters that the cells are forming, and you can also draw a border on cluster that you like and select the cells and, for example, count the number of the cells, uh, which is great because it gives the basic results, uh, but it has a lot of problems. For example, uh, the dimensionality of the input data is usually more than 20 and well sometimes more than 40 or 50 uh, which uh, is a bit problematic if you uh, view this kind of the data in two dimensions because you usually miss a lot of dimensions and you can miss a lot of interesting data and a lot of interesting clusters that you would see if you uh, could examine all the dimensions at once the second concern is reproducibility of this kind of analysis because if you base something on drawing the cell borders manually you will probably get very different results from different people that uh, draw the borders so uh, this kind of analysis is not easily reproducible even between a single individual the third problem is the time required to finish this kind of analysis uh, because if you want to uh, examine all uh, combinations of say 40 dimensions you will have a lot of time uh, sitting at the computer and clicking the scatter plots which you do not want. Uh, the usual approach to solve these problems is to use some machine learning or unsupervised analysis to cluster the cells. Uh, there are lots of tools for that. Uh, one of the most used one is FlowSum for the R computing environment which scales pretty well, you can process data sets with millions of cells with that. Uh, so what we did originally was that we have taken FlowSum and ported it to uh, Julia, which worked well, loaded a lot of data, solved some issues, but there were still some problems. Although we were using distributed computations for speeding that up, uh, there was a problem with memory consumed by single individual nodes. Uh, and so the whole analysis was kind of limited by the memory and bandwidth available to single nodes. 
uh, even distributed setting, which in turn translated to uh, the thing that we require big mem nodes in the slum cluster to do the computation, uh, which is a problem because there are not many big mem nodes, and well, of course, uh, we wanted to do better. Uh, the second problem is that the original Gigasom wasn't very flexible. Uh, we really wanted the users to be able to easily customize the whole workflow, the whole pipeline for processing the data. Uh, so we got several new uh, aims. Uh, the new Gigasom aims to generalize the distributed processing so that uh, even the beginners can uh, easily write a program that distributes across multiple workers and works uh, in a distributed way and also we wanted to make it as optimal as possible using only simple and pure Julia without any well, hardcore tricks uh, so that the scaling problem is fixed. So the question is how do you load that amount of data into Julia? Uh, normally we have used the distributed package which provides the distributed environment with remote calls and workers which is nice and we intended to split the data among the workers so that no, there is no problem with uh, memory on each of the workers uh, we were quite surprised that uh, distributed arrays package which is originally intended for this kind of purposes uh, doesn't help a lot uh, mainly because it is intended to do something completely different distributed arrays in fact distributes the data to ease the amount of computation that is done on one worker not uh, the amount of memory that is stored on one worker and we have found quite uh, unpleasant fact that if uh, you um, touch the distributed arrays objects uh, in the wrong way for example if you forget local part of that or if you uh, try to reference the wrong part of the data on the wrong worker uh, Julia starts auto transferring the big data uh, onto remote workers, it takes a lot of time and sometimes the workers uh, trigger the out of memory exception and there are problems. So uh, we started uh, thinking about what to do with that and decided to write it a bit differently and write a small MapReduce clone right in Julia. Let's look at what distributed arrays actually does. Uh, if you are using the distributed arrays and want to store the data on the remote worker, you take some matrix called distribute function on the matrix and you will get a distributed matrix uh, of type D array, uh, which is some kind of magical reference to that kind of data, which is nice because it actually behaves like an actual array. There are like it's snow is friendly. Uh, there is no problem with working with that. On the other side, uh, it has problems if you touch it in the wrong way. It usually starts to fetch the remote data automatically and uh, in our environment with the lot of data you will usually get an out of memory situation which kills the worker process on the node which in turn kills your computation which may contain pre precious results and precious data which we do not want so what we did is that we have designed a really seriously primitive function for saving the data at remote workers which is called save at and uh, it does a very simple thing you give it a worker you give it a symbol uh, that you want uh, the data to be saved in and you get uh, you give it a value which can be a value but also it can be an expression and well it takes the value and the symbol packs it into another expression and sends it to the remote worker for evaluation in main module so basically for example if you uh, want to save a portion of the data uh, that you have on the main worker on a worker process as a variable data you can just call save at worker number two to the variable name data uh, your portion of data it gets saved there automatically also if you want to uh, send something different than the data for example if you want the remote worker to actually compute the data for you you don't have to pass in the data you can pass in the expression which gets evaluated on the remote worker which is a pretty nice way to separate the local and remote evolution which is a bit obfuscated with distributed arrays in the nice interface um, but also makes uh, quite a bit of sense for the users because well um, very basically what is quoted gets evaluated on the remote worker what is not quoted gets evaluated locally at the main worker it's nice uh, distinction the only thing that you still need to keep an eye on is to quote carefully what is quoted is executed remotely and may produce different results uh, probably unexpected 
this concept in fact extends extremely easily for example you can write a get from function which does the opposite thing from safe at function it takes the expression evaluates it on the remote worker and fetches you the result instead of saving it into the variable on the remote worker and uh, these things as a primitives extend quite nicely to a lot of other functions for example you can uh, transform a lot of remote variables to a different lot of remote variables and mass using a simple for cycle save at and with fetch to make sure that uh, the transformation has finished on, before you start doing other things on the main worker the whole concept extends very easily to produce a simple MapReduce framework in around 150 lines of code, which is nice. Uh, the library we have now supports MapReduce, loading and saving, basically importing and exporting to datasets, collecting datasets, uh, some various uh, types of for each, uh, various types of cycles around the data, uh, removing the dataset from the workers, uh, aggregation of the dataset identifiers into a specialized structure, and lots more. The usage is extremely simple. If you have used MapReduce, you can very easily compute, for example, mean of the data set by just connecting the functions together. You got the sum, uh, divide uh, the result by length, uh, and that's it. One of the two main things that Gigasum does very efficiently is a loading of the data into the workers uh, without causing any worker to run out of the memory. Uh, from the user point of view, it looks extremely simple. You just take the, uh, the names of the files and call corresponding function for loading the FCS set. Uh, internally, it is a bit more complicated. The FCS files need to get uh, examined. Uh, the master node needs to compute the slices uh, and the dimensions of the slices for each worker. And each worker needs to load the actual data uh, that belongs to it uh, from the shared file system. On the other hand, uh, the whole thing is extremely efficient because all communication, centralized communication, uh, centralized computation is uh, reduced to a bare minimum. Uh, for example, loading of the IMPC TSL data set takes just around 10 seconds with 32 workers. The second thing that Gigasum does very efficiently is the batch training of self-organizing maps, which from the user perspective looks also very simple. And by accident, it is also very simple from the internal perspective because all of the iterations of the batch training are just uh, one distributed map reduce uh, that just sends the self organizing map to the workers that do the update, send the update back, the updates are aggregated, and the iterations are repeated. Uh, the obvious question is whether this still scales nicely. We were pleasantly surprised that it actually scales very nicely. Uh, for example, when feeding the process with 256 CPUs, uh, we were reaching speeds in million cells per second clustered, which is nice. We did quite a bit of detail benchmarking to see how the whole thing is going to behave uh, if more data is added. Uh, we can probably say now that uh, the scaling is pretty much good. Uh, the communication overhead, which is the worst uh, source of slowdowns in distributed environments like this, uh, is probably worse at 10 dimensions on very big self-organizing maps, which was expectable, but uh, the overhead is uh, only like two times worse for 256 nodes than for a single node, which can be considered a very good result. Let's see what you can do with the actual map. Uh, the self-organizing map is a simplified model of the data which can be used basically as data uh, reduced to several well, landmarks in the multi-dimensional space and you can for example run a clustering on those instead of the real data uh, which because the sum model is a lot smaller also the clustering takes uh, a lot less time than on the actual huge data so uh, you can get clusters and you can also take the self-organizing map and look at the content of individual samples in the different compartments of the, uh, the self-organizing map, which gets you some kind of map of each sample reduced to cell frequencies in different compartments. That is very easily used for comparing the different properties in the samples, for example, in the clusters. For example, you can see how the blue cluster compares in different samples that were taken different times, so how an individual is, for example, evolving. Or you can take different samples from a different patient, say, and compare the baseline and treated samples to see if something happens with the treatment. Our current use case for this is to predict the biomarkers that could be used for allergen immunotherapy. 
the problem that is getting solved now at the Luxembourg Institute of Health is uh, the question why some immunotherapies work on people generally well and some other do not work uh, either at all or depending on the individual work or only partially. Uh, uh, the collection of data and the examination of the data uh, that was collected from lots of individuals using Giasom should be able to shed some light onto this question. One of the new things in Giasum is the support for advanced visualizations. Uh, the picture you see here is a result of Embedsom, uh, which is a new dimensional reduction algorithm, and Gigascutter, which is a package for rasterizing insane amounts of points into nice uh, 2D rasters and into nice bitmaps. Embedsom works by taking the high dimensional points from the dataset and projecting them on the relatively low dimensional self organizing maps. You can see this makes the dataset arguably easier to watch and much easier to see the actual clusters of the cells than in the self organizing map. The embedding actually contains more than 1 billion cells, which translates to more than 1 billion points in the picture. Uh, upon magnification we can observe quite a lot of more interesting details. Luckily for working with this amount of data, both the embedding process and the rasterization process are implemented as trivially parallel, so uh, you can perfectly use the MapReduce framework that we have constructed also for those. If you would like to try any of the software that we are talking about, you can just head to GitHub to LCSB BioCore group and see the Gigasom and Gigascatter JL packages. Uh, the Gigasom contains all the algorithms we are talking about, uh, also it should be applicable to more types of data than just flow cytometry, but uh, the package now is oriented towards flow cytometry, so it contains quite a bit of tooling with working with FCS files and transforming the data according to the principles that are common in flow cytometry. Gigascatter JL is uh, probably applicable to anything that needs rasterization and contains quite a bit of points. Generally, there are two main outcomes of Gigasom development. Uh, the most pleasant surprise for us was that uh, we found out that we have produced quite high performance software that is uh, performing uh, just as well as trivial implementation of the same thing in C++ without much low level optimizations and without touching the specialized high performance languages, which is nice. Uh, the second pleasant surprise came from the Julia ecosystem because uh, we have found that there is quite a bit of packages that are easy to integrate into, into existing uh, computations and may help a lot of different things. For example, we have found nice nearest neighbors package uh, which is there for constructing spatial indexes for multi-dimensional data and allowing you to uh, quickly search for nearest neighbors uh, using the index uh, in the multi-dimensional data which is in fact the main operation that some training, some classification and embed some actually do. Uh, so it helped quite a lot just by plugging in the package we got several times speed up in many interesting cases, which is nice. Finally, there are still things to be improved. In Gigasom we would really like to have a memory mapping of the data from the storage which would probably help a lot with uh, the risks of getting out of memory errors and also it would probably ease a lot of situation for the operating system that runs the computation. From the supporting packages we kind of hope that the threads are going out of experimental status soon and will get into stable uh, because uh, for us they seem pretty stable and certainly they would help a lot with saving memory and bandwidth and gigasom and making the whole computation a lot faster. Also, cluster managers could probably report more details about the SLARM task allocation that we get, for example the locality of the task and grouping of the task on uh, different hosts, which would probably help in the future spawn threads correctly on different nodes to again save memory and bandwidth. And that is everything from the talk. If you have any questions about Gigason, please contact us either via the conference channel or using the GitHub issue tracker if your question is more programming oriented. Uh, we will look forward. Finally, thank you for your attention. Uh, enjoy the rest of the JuliaCon 2020 and see you on the next one.